Hello everyone, I'm Daz and welcome to American Civil War and UK History Podcast. This presentation is available as a video on our YouTube channel and as a podcast from wherever you get your podcasts from. And remember, we are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and TikTok. And joining me today is friend and historian of Mark's English History Channel. It's Mark Wheatcroft. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Dad. Hello, everyone. In this podcast today, we will be discussing the end of World War One and the armistice, which is a really important day so firstly mark could you start with uh, giving us an overview of world war one why how who's involved some of the key points okay so i'm gonna try and do this whistle stop because this could be a whole series just based on this but we are the cause of the first world war is numerous it's very complex but in effect you're looking at going back to the year 1870 and it's important for two reasons because it's first of all you get what you call the Franco-Prussian War so Prussia and France go to war it's a very quick war the Prussians steamroll the French take Paris and as part of their the peace negotiations to end this the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 the Germans annex the regions of Alsace and Lorraine from France, which becomes a major political issue going forward. The other major important reason why the Franco-Prussian War is so important is because during this war is the time of Otto Bismarck and the unification of Germany. So the small states of like Saxony, Bavaria, all starting coming under Prussian control and then becoming the country of Germany or Deutschland. So that's where it goes back to some people say it could go back further but most the, most people say that 1870 is the point at which the real starting points are so fast forward 30 years into 1900 and you've got basically three main elements so or four main elements so what i describe them when i'm teaching teaching my history classes is I'd call them what they call the main causes. So it's militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. And what you get is in 1905, for example, the Royal Navy launched HMS Dreadnought, which is a game changer in naval warfare. Prior to that, Kaiser Wilhelm II, who obviously, like King George V and other royal family is a grandchild of Queen Victoria. So he's come over to Britain for numerous different state occasions. He's seen the size of our Navy at Cow's Week and the Spit and Naval Review and stuff like that. And he's got jealous and he started building one up. Britain had a plan at that point that we was always to be bigger than the second and third navies combined. So this, this escalation in the naval arms race by Germany significantly challenges that and by launching HMS Dreadnought unwittingly the Royal Navy has hit the start button on a on an arms race by building these two types these classes of ships between the two countries then you've got the alliance system so the alliances you've got the triple alliance which was Germany, Austria, Hungary and Italy and then you've got the trip, and that's kind of by the Triple Entente. So that's the United Kingdom, France, and Russia. So the idea being these two power blocks, very similar to the idea that developed during the Cold War of mutually assured destruction, that these two power blocks would be so devastating if they went to war with each other that actually they'd, they'd actually work to keep peace instead. Doesn't quite work like that because. Of other factors so again we come back to then imperialism so imperialism it's the empire so britain and france had the biggest empires in the world at the time the germans are trying to muscle in on this as well so again that's adding tension to it then you get down to the nationalist nationalism so the, obviously nationalism it's pride of your country that kind of thing but mainly what's happening is that it all then unfolds around this cause in serbia and bosnia so serbia bosnia is belongs to at this point austro-hungary but the serbs here is there so it's a, it, it 
it's something that reoccurs again in the uh, in the early to mid 1990s in that there's this doctrine of what they call greater Serbia. So that's basically wherever Serbian has touched his foot actually belongs to Serbia. And so they see that the Bosnian area belongs to them. And this is when things start coming to a head. So you get to the June the 28th, 1914, in the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo. So what happens is that the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, Archduke van Ferdinand, is visiting Sarajevo. And in Sarajevo at the time is a Serbian-backed terrorist group called the Black Hand. And they have made a plan to assassinate the Archduke. Now, at first, the plan doesn't work, okay? So the, the, it, it's to ambush the motorcade as it's travelling through the city to go to the city hall. As, they trans, as they're going through the city, the first attacky actually bottles it and doesn't go through with his attempts on the Archduke's life. Motorcade comes up to work the position of the next attacker he throws a bomb at the car, carrying the Archduke. It bounces off, but it explodes in the car, right next to the car, next to it, wounding some of his... So there's possibly advisors on there. There's definitely sort of his security staff on there. They're taken off to hospital. Franz Ferdinand carries on to the city hall, which actually gets destroyed in the bombing of Sarajevo in the 1990s. Um, he takes part in his the civic ceremony that he's there for, comes out. When he's getting into the car, he asks for the driver to take him to the hospitals to see the injured. At this point, a, another member of the Black Hand called Gavrilo Princip has decided, has given up. He sort of, the, 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 the plan's failed. I'm going to go off and get a sandwich. Um, so, so he's just gone off, I mean, got his sandwich and sort of mingling with the crowd. Not expecting anything now. He thinks that like, the chance to kill the Archduke has gone. However, once the car leaves the city hall, we're travelling along the, the road along the bank of the river and it should make a right-hand turn, but it, the driver goes past it. In the confusion, the driver decides, I'll just reverse back and then take the corner. As that car is coming around the corner, Princip comes out of the sandwich shop and the car containing the Archduke is sitting at a standstill right in front of him. So he pulls the gun from his, shirt, from his jacket, steps out, fires three shots. Two of them go into the Archduke, mortally wounding him. The other one goes into his wife, Sophia. And... They're rushed off to hospital where they die. Gavrilo Princip is cap is arrested. Now, because of all of the build up and the tensions and the alliances, this is where it all gets a lit goes out of control because Gavrilo Princip is arrested. They obviously interrogate him. He, he declares that he's of Serbian ethnicity and that he's part of this group that are backed by backed by Serbia. But rather than just putting him on trial, finding him guilty, executing him, which could have stopped any other snowballing effect to have a large effect from taking place, the Austro-Hungarians decide they need to teach Serbia a lesson. And they, to do that, they're going to attack them and they're going to bombard Belgrade, which if you look at the map of this on the screen, the border between Austro-Hungary and Serbia is actually the Danube River, which flows through Belgrade. So the attack on Belgrade is attacked just across the river. So they start shelling what's known as the Kalamagdan Fortress, which is on the cliff of which Belgrade sort of spools down from the other side. Um, and in the build-up to this, you start getting the alliances making threats and promises to each other. So 
Serbia, Serbians are of Slavic origin, so they're seen as sometimes referred to as Little Russia, for example. So Russia has decided, uh, declared that if Austro-Hungary attacks Serbia, they will declare war on Austro-Hungary. Germany, who's obviously allied to Austro-Hungary, then declare their support for Austro-Hungary and say that they would support them and do whatever they need to do. And this is often referred to as the blank check, okay? So because they're not sort of given any kind of stipulations or any kind of control, and that's why Germany often gets the blame for the war, because they could have prevent, they were the only ones really that could have prevented Austro-Hungary from doing anything, because if Austro-Hungary had attacked Serbia without Germany's support, Russia would have come in, it would have been a more localised war, and it would be, that would have been that. However, Germany decides that they're going to back the Austro-Hungarians um, unconditionally and offer this blank check support. Now, Austro-Hungary at that point then launched the attack against Serbia. Russia obviously joins the war against Austro-Hungary, which then in turn means that Germany declare war on Russia. Now, Germany has a, has a problem and this problem was identified way back in 1905 in that with the, alliance, the way the alliance systems were, Germany potentially could be fighting wars on two fronts against Russia in the east, France in the west. So a German general of the time, von Schlieffen, had devised a plan. And he, in his plan, he, he believed that it would take Russia up to six months to mobilise all, it, it, all of its forces against Germany. But in the meantime they would launch a lightning strike against France. So at first they would attack on the French, the, the direct German French border in the Alsace Lorraine area. So on the map between the bottom of Luxembourg, the top of Switzerland, in that kind of area. But it's only be a light attack. And then they fall back under the, under the force of the French army. But this is a trap that they're laying. Um, because the main thrust will then come through Belgium. Now, von Schlieffen predicted and hoped that the Belgians would remain neutral and allow them free passage. That way they could sweep round, capture Paris, defeat the French, and then be back over the other side of Germany on the Eastern Front in time for when the, the six month period when the Russians will be ready. Now, it doesn't go that way for the for the Germans because of two reasons. So first of all, the Russians actually get back, get ready a lot quicker than they anticipated. So they're actually then forced to withdraw troops. Schlieff, von Schlieffen dies before 1914. I can't remember when, but he, and he's replaced, so his role in con, conducting all this goes to von, von Mokta. He doesn't, I won't say he doesn't believe in it, but he has reservations in certain aspects. So, for example, he keeps more troops in the southern sector that's to fall back and allow them to fall into the trap. He, he's got his concerns that, that, that that's not strong enough, so he keeps troops there. So, Von Schieffen's plan of the right hand shoulder of the right hand marker of the German army as it sweeps around was to brush the channel. Is a lot nervous, so it's not, it, it doesn't pull the front out quite as much as it should do. Belgium also refused German access, so in the end, what happens is that they invade Belgium anyway. Now, there's a treaty goes back to about 1860, which declares that that Britain would always defend Belgium's neutrality, and so when Germany crossed the border into Belgium that activates that treaty. So Britain sends an ultimatum to Germany saying, if, you don't, if you're not out of Belgium by this time, a state of war exists between us. Um, the Belgians defend and fight harder than the Germans fought, so it takes them longer to get through. Germany have no inclination of leaving Belgium. So on the 4th of August, 1914, Britain declares war on Belgium. This brings us to what's known as the Battle of the Frontier. So the whole section is known as that. And the BAF, the British Expeditionary Force, is deployed to Belgium. Um, they fight at the Battle of Mons. Um, 
hold up the German army, but it's just too strong. The positions untenable. Actually, the, the British army at BF at Mons holds, but the either side gives way, so that they have to go into a retreat. And it, that you have this big sweeping retreat in front of the, this wide up arc in German army. So you get to the Battle of the Marne, and this is the one that's just outside Paris. The, the French army is delivered from Paris to the battlefield in Parisian taxis. Um, it's the last gasp that like, this is it. If we don't stop them now, the war's probably going to be over. Um, they fight this battle. They push back, push the Germans back. But then around that sort of time, as we know from the, Civil, the American Civil War side of things, the, the power of the weaponry and it's 50 years on, it's got even stronger. They start to dig in. And what starts off as small sections of trenches, as each side tries to outflank the other, it gradually grows and grows and grows. Different sections of trenches start to meet. Eventually, you get the old front line of the Western Front is developed. And that runs from a place called Nierpur, in Belgium, which is on the North Sea coast, and there, there the Western Front, actually the barbed wire goes out into the sea, all the way down through Belgium into France, and through France to Bell on the French, um, Germany, Switzerland border. So most, that whole section, that's the front line. And you get some other battles that occur in 1914. So you get the first battle of Ypres, for example. And generally that was very cleanish to some extent in that it's 1914 that you get the famous Christmas truce, for example. It, it kind of happens again in places for the rest of the war, but not to the same extent because it... it the, the feeling is, the feeling changes as the war goes on, but 1914, you got you get the famous Christmas truce. So then we go into 1915, and you get the Second Battle of Ypres. Now this is where sort of, like I say, that feeling really changes after the Second Battle of Ypres. It's the first time the Germans unleash uh, unleash master gas on Allied troops, and that is a that's seen as against the rules of war sort of thing and that's when feelings between the belligerent countries really start to change in terms of the troops on the the normal fighting men and but the other big one that you big battle that you get in 1915 it actually happens away from the western front it happens down against a german ally who we've not talked about which is the ottoman empire and it's the Gallipoli campaign. So this was the idea that we could not try and knock out the Ottoman Empire by, by forcing our way through the, the Dardanelles and taking Constantinople, Istanbul. Um, in 1915, it was Winston Churchill's brainchild. It's a com it, amphibious assault and it's a complete and utter failure. So if you watched our D-Day video, and I spoke about Churchill's reluctance for amphibious operations, it goes back to this in 1915. Um, so that, 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 that's a, an overview of 1915, it's sort of more the same. And then you get to 1916. Now, 1916 is the year of the big battles. And to, for me, I feel that the First World War actually follows parallels to the American Civil War quite closely, in that this middle year of the war, like with 1863, is that really important one. Okay, So... There's three massive battles that take place in 1916. So in February, the Germans look at assault <coughs> against the French fortified town of Verdun. Now, yes, the aim was to take it. But von Falkenhayn, the German commander, had another idea in mind. And it's when the war of attrition really starts to begin because he, he makes the comment that his aim is to bleed France white. Okay, it says throw enough troops in there, kill enough Frenchmen that they can no longer fight. And he unleashes this and it goes, it, so it's from February onwards. It's, there's sort of almost a whole year he's, he's spent fighting around Verdun. And in July, 
on July the 1st, the, the British launched the offensive on the Somme. Now, that was actually planned, an offensive on the Western Front was planned in 1915 for 1916. It was planned to be a joint offensive with the British and the French on the Eastern Front with a simultaneous assault by the Russians in the East, which is known as the Brusilov Offensive. Now, because of the assault on Verdun, it actually takes a large proportion of the French troops away. So it's fought on the Somme. Haig, the British commander, actually wanted to fight it in Flanders, but he was overruled and it was decided to be on the Somme, mainly because the Somme River is actually a demarcation line. The British are to the north, the French are to the south. So if you're going to do a combined operation between the two, that's, put, that's the perfect place to do it. Um, the first day is an absolute disaster. We lose 60, close to 60,000 men on the, on the first day. So um, unmitigated disaster. Some of them to hardly get out of the trenches, but that the some offensive goes from September to November. And by the time you get to November, actually there is an argument there that it's more of a tactical victory than a, than a defeat because we, by the time we've taken the objectives, of Bapone, that although that initially was the first week's objective, then it was to go into Berlin, but we'd taken that. More importantly, we've relieved the pressure off of Verdun. And if you look at the casualty lists or the casualty figures, Britain and France combined lose less men at the Battle of the whole campaign than the Germans do. Now, when you've got the almost inexhaustible manpower of the empire, we can afford to lose those men where the Germans can't because they've got a they've got a much smaller manpower pool. So it's very similar again going back linking it to the American Civil War to um, Grant fighting the Overland Campaign in that he he can lose the men but Lee. Lee Carnival to so it, it, it links to that that type of warfare. So that that that's happening on uh, in the Grand War. At sea, 1916 is almost just as important because you get the only major clash of the two fleets, so the British Grand British um, Grand Fleet and the German High Seas Fleet at, at, at about 90 miles off of the west coast of Denmark. Uh, over Jutland Bank, and it's, the, it's known as the Clash of the Dreadnoughts. Again, it's a inconclusive battle um, to some extent, and that both sides claim victory. Uh, the Germans claim victory because they sink 14 of our ships to their 11. Um, however, when you look into the figures of it, it doesn't, it, it, they can kind of be a bit distorted. So Although they sink 14 of our ships, a lot of our ships that sink are old, uh, old obsolete ships compared to Germany's more modern. Plus also our fleet that goes out and fights in the Battle of Jutland is 154 ships to their 99. So in terms of percentage, we again, we can afford to lose more ships than they can. So um, but at the end of the battle, the German... Dreadnought fleet goes back into port. It never comes out again. We, the British Navy, is able to continue the blockade of the German ports, which will have a big impact in what we get when we get onto 1918. Also, it then means that the only naval warfare that the Germans can actually use is, is submarines. And it sends in 1917, they go to the unrestricted sinking, where basically anything, it's free game out there in the Atlantic which eventually will force America into the war. Um, something I didn't mention in 1915 was the sinking of the Lusitania as well. Um, the British flagship, it, it, it was a passenger liner. It did have war supplies on it of some description. We don't know what exactly, um, but there was a lot of American citizens on board when the Germans torpedo and sink it off the coast of Ireland. That had a massive turning point in America's ideology in the First World War is that it went from a completely neutral stance to 
favouring the Allies, then in 1917 joining when unrestricted warfare is completely um, launched against all shipping in the Atlantic. So 1917, again, you get some key major battles. So the Canadians managed to take Jimmy Ridge, which is a highly important strategical position just outside Lille. Um, and then the Battle of Passchendaele or the Third Battle of Ypres takes place there as well. So this is the what the, the after the summit's the most famous battle. It's the one that's fought, that's fought in deep mud um, in Flanders. So that's um, that occurs. But outside, and also you get the Battle of Cambrai, which is the big tank battle of the First World War. Um, so major developments you see going through the war. Um, But also 1917, it's the year when things start to fall apart for certain countries. So in February 1917, you get the the February Revolution in Russia, which ousts the Tsar. Um, Kerensky comes in with his um, democratic government, which in turn in October, the Germans basically pushed the nuclear button in terms of Russia. And they said they um, ship in Lenin. Um, and he unleashes the October Revolution, seizes power for the communists. And at that point, starts negotiating with the Germans for a surrender on the Eastern Front. Uh, the French army at this point also is close to mutiny. Um, they're having enough as well. Um, and with the Americans, the one plus point for them in 1917 is that as a manpower gap, they are plugging that hole which the French mutiny is, is causing. Now, we have to remember that or differentiate between American involvement in the First World War and American involvement in the Second. In the First World War, it's a lot smaller. They're, 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 they're only in for 18 months max. And it, it's a manpower thing. It's not a industrial or munitions or equipment thing that they can supply in the in the Second World War. The, the time that they're actually fighting in the First World War is actually less time than it is from Pearl Harbor to D Day, for example. So they're not. It's nowhere near the same the, the, the same calibre. Um, America's position in the world. Is, is lower at that stage, okay? So um, it is a, um, at this point, it's manpower pretty much only that they're, they're bringing into it in 1917. So 1918, you get the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Um, this is the, the treaty that ends the war in with the Russians. And to be honest, possibly Germany's best chance of a, a decent terms would be if they would have at this point sued for peace in the West as well before the Americans would really come in and have much of an influence and they'd probably have to give out Alsace-Lorraine but they might have got away with a bit more than they did um, instead what they do is they launch one last major offensive in that spring that's known as Kaiserslack so it's Kaiser's battle um, it's the battle main thing the important thing is it's the, finally the trench warfare has broken out. So one side has made a significant breakthrough. Again, they kind of stopped around the Marne area, similar, and then pushed back. But the, the Allies at that, at that point then just keep pushing them back, pushing them back out past the front lines, and they're going back towards Germany. And it gets to around about... September, late September, Ludendorff, the commander, tells, oh, the field commander tells Hindenburg that basically we need to surrender. And so that's the point at which the um, the end of the war starts moving at, at, at quite a pace. Right, thank you for explaining that. That was really good. Um, really interesting. Um, and you managed to fit in four years in that really short space period of time so thanks for that so that leads us to yeah. like, into the 11th of the 11th 1918 which is known as the armistice firstly what is an armistice for people that don't know yeah so obviously it leads to it now an armistice is another word for ceasefire 
Okay, so the war itself doesn't end officially on the 11th of November. It has some, it, it basically means we stop fighting. Okay, um, so there's a bit of a build up to that though. Um, so, like I say, on the 20th, September the 28th, Ludendorff tells Hindenburg, our only alternative now is we need to sue for peace. Um, so they start then having the discussions about maybe what we should do, um, what, what we should sue for, but then things start moving, I say things start moving at a pace. So in Octo October the 30th, the German fleet at Kiel mutiny and armed sailors take to the street demanding a revolution. Um, by 3rd of November, they've got control of the town and that call for revolution is at a pitch that by the 9th of November, the Chancellor, who is new, fairly new in post, Prince Max, he's the brother-in-law of the Kaiser, has offered his office to the socialist Frederick Ebert. Okay, so you've also got a communist, uh, there's a, set, a communist revolution beginning to take place in Germany. So by offering the chancellorship to a socialist, they're trying to sort of get a left-wing government in the, that's moderate and so try to sort of get people to support that rather than um, rather than the communists. Um, he takes the office um, and immediately declares that the Kaiser has to go and he abdicates on the 10th of November. He goes, in, he goes to neutral Holland with, with his family to doom and Later in 1919, he assigns the official documents and his sons declare that they give up their claimant to the throne. And that ends basically the German royal family. The Kaiser lives out his days in doom. He dies at the age of 80. Um, so yeah, going, but, but going back to the armistice, yeah, it kind of means ceasefire. Um, it, it, it was a way to, it was the quickest way to stop the war. Um, the actual, so you have... Oh, so can you through that famous event then, please, mate? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. There. Yeah, so the armistice is signed in a in the railway carriage in, in Champagne. Um, the German um, delegation that's led by Matthias Ebsberger, um, he, he's arrived and they discuss the... the, the um, the signing of the armistice. Now, the terms that were agreed was that it required the evacuation of all occupied territory in France, including Alsace and Lorraine, so the French are going to get those, those territories back. Military evacuation of the West Bank of the Rhine as well, so you're going deep into, into German territory with that the, there'll be no troops. Um, the, the surrender of enormous amounts of equipment, the internment of all submarines and capital ships of the high seas fleet, and return of all lands gained through treaties with belligerents in the east as well. So that the, the, the gain, the territorial gains that they've made off the Russian at Vesatovs get returned to the Russians, and um, that there will be made to pay reparations or war or that war costs and the continuation of the blockade will continue. Um, so that was actually signed at 5 a.m. on the 11th of November with it to take effect at 11 a.m. So only six hours to get the message out that the, the war in effect is over. Okay, so you've got on there, you've got um, Ebsberger's signature, you've got um, Ferdinand Fox as well, who is um, the French general. Um, so mo mo most of this was done. Ferdinand Fox, I didn't mention that, that late in the war, um, they decided, similar to in Eisenhower in the Second World War, that Ferdinand Fox would be the supreme commander so, so that there's more joined up action between Britain France and America, um, rather than prior earlier in the war, Hagen and Fock were two um, 
it were independent commands. So this was the, the joining of the Allies under one one command. So that it made uh, command and control a lot easier. Am I right in saying? Sorry, am I right in saying some of the fighting actually continued uh, after the eleven a.m. deadline? Yeah. So obviously, six, we're looking at a time when actually communication is still quite rudimental. So six hours to get the message from campaign out to the different air, different parts of the battlefield is that is going to be quite hard. So yeah, fighting did continue. Um, it's estimated that nearly 3,000 men die on the 11th itself. Um, it's a bit awkward to say exactly how many of those sort of were. I'm not sure how that figures come come about. So potentially you might get people there that were wounded weeks ago that are, that, that was the day that they passed away and so they're picked up in that. Um, but it does show that there is still elements of sporadic fighting along the front whilst everyone's trying to take stock of the situation and the news is getting through because obviously the front lines are, are quite distant from command centres so yes the messages would have been going to them but then as it was trickling down the last people to actually hear that the war was over there's actually the people that are right at the coalface so it, it's you would have had sporadic fighting continuing beyond that as before the messages actually reached all, all of the um, all of the localised commands and down onto the front lines. And uh, so once the armistice is signed, do the armies stay in France and, and, and you know, in these, uh, in uh, the trenches and that until, uh, how long do they actually stay there for until, um, you know, after this is signed? Uh, so the, these armies of occupation, um, they're not actually in the trenches pretty much by spring of 1918, trench warfare is actually gone. Um, it's blasted out of there. Okay, yep. um, in terms of sort of what, what we know it as, it's probably more, I would imagine that they were still sort of semi dug in, but you're probably looking more like small unit foxholes, similar to what we get in the Second World War as compared to like the long line of trenches. Um, that we imagine it, that, that imagination tells us of the First World War. So um, I know some of the French units follow the German army back to make sure that they do clear and they do semi-occupied parts of Germany. Um, there's um, parts of the English army there, but for the British army, but I think for a lot of it, it, it it's kind of, once they know that the ceasefire is holding that the Germans have, have complied with their end of the deal it's get the guys home now um, mm -hmm. and, and it, it starts moving quickly in terms of bringing them home demobbing them and getting them getting them out um I say that, that there's a small army of occupation in and around the border areas just uh, early on and obviously there's a there's a huge cleanup operation to undergo so you've got troops out there that are bringing bodies in, rebuilding, turning them in, in, in the war cemeteries. Um, armament disposal, things like that. So th 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 there are troops there, but in terms of combat, well, it, it, it's finished. Yeah. And so like Mark said as well, the armistice sees the end of uh, the, the four years of fighting. But there's still a long way to go, which leads us to a very famous treaty known as the Treaty of Versailles. So please explain this important event, please, Mark. Yeah, so the Treaty of Versailles is what comes from a larger event called the Paris Peace Conference. So they have this, it, it's held at the Paris of Versailles and it takes place in, in the Hall of Mirrors there. Um, and at the end of it, they draw up the Treaty of Formal Surrender. Um, that officially ends the war. So as I said before, that the armistice is more of a ceasefire. This is the formal end of the war. Um, you've got the French President George Clemenceau there, David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, President Woodrow Wilson from America, and Johannes Bell of Germany. Now, with the 
allies, there's strong disagreement about what we should do with Germany. So in 1917, Woodrow Wilson gave a speech where he outlined 17, or early 1918, I can't remember exactly which, he outlined 14 points um, for German surrender and for peace. Um, however, Clemenceau, being the French, where the war had been fought, they'd lost the highest, they had the highest amount of casualties on the, in the Allied side of anyone, like their youth had gone, um, which will explain a lot about the French, um, was there performed morale in World War II, for example? So one of the key French commanders who's tasked with taking back in Battle of Verdun is Patin, who becomes the president of France after the German invasion in 1940 and is often criticised for his Vichy government, but it's, uh, he's, he's haunted by Verdun. So... It, it's a hugely traumatic event for France, so they that they they're, they're just out for punishment. Um, Britain, they kind of want to punish Germany. They're not quite in the same um, to the same level as Clemenceau, um, but they want two things. So they 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 want control of German imperial te- empire territories and and that of the Ottomans. Um, they'd signed a separate armistice, the army of, uh, armistice of Mudros um, in October 1918. And also they wanted um, the threat of the Germ- of Germany's naval power to be extinguished. So that is what the, they were coming into. Now, again, going back to the American involvement in the First World War, they're actually considered the junior partner in this. So then they're, they're not that, that, se- that senior place that they, they will become in World War II. At this, in this war, they are seen as the junior par- partner. So he, Woodrow Wilson's 14 points are, com- are pretty much completely over, uh, uh, overruled by Clemenceau and Lord George. There's a couple that that, that, that get through, which we'll talk about one of them in particular later. Um, but the arm um, or the treaty is a real punishment document. So, for example, um, territorial changes that um, Alsace and Lorraine certainly go back to France. There's a Polish corridor to the sea that's created that leaves a East Prussian enclave um, that's very similar to sort of like the Kaliningrad on Russian enclave at the moment, um, slightly bigger, stretching a bit further across Poland, but uh, Königsberg, which is the German name for Kaliningrad, was, was sort of like the capital of that area. So it separates that, uh, gives Poland access to the sea. Um, in terms of other countries that are involved as well, Austro-Hungary is split up um, and the Ottoman Empire is split up. Um, also part, uh, doesn't really come under total tra- changes, but there's also a um, part of that that says that Austria and Germany shouldn't, can never jo- join together again or form an alliance together. Um, Military-wise, their army can only be used in defense for defensive capability, and no more, and be of no more than a hundred thousand men. Um, the navy is significantly reduced, so it, it it's allowed six pre-dreadnoughts, so pre boats of before the pre-dreadnought class and no submarines. Now, the, the German Navy is ordered to sail to the Royal Naval base of Scarpa Flow, which is in the Orkney Islands. Uh, it sails into there in 1919, and, but rather than surrender into the Royal Navy, it then they then scuttle all and sink all their ships it, it, in Scarpa Flow. Um, but either way, Britain has got what it wants because, yes, OK, we probably would have preferred to have had, had their ships added to our own fleet, but if we if they're at the bottom of the sea, 
it does the same thing. The German Navy is now at a point where they can't challenge the, the British Navy. And they're also limited to the size of ship that they can build. And there's another treaty that comes later, the London Naval Treaty, which is a, a, a more worldwide thing to try and prevent the size of ships. And weirdly enough, that actually, by putting that restriction on the Germans, well, when you get to the Second World War, that's why they have such, their engineering is so good, because by putting a restriction on weight, it meant that when they built, like I said, Bismarck and the Tirpitz, they were relying, instead of riveting, they went to welding um, because it saved weight, and yet it's a much more modern and, and a better process. So uh, I'm willing, I'm willing the, what they decided in 1919 actually led the Germans to a technical advancement under the Third Reich. Um, likewise, um, there was a, uh, in the London Naval Conferences, there was a limit on how many battleships a country could have. And that's what led the Japanese to having so many aircraft carriers in the Pacific in the Second World War. So there's, a, there's some weird anomalies that go out of this. Um, also, they're not allowed to have an air force. Um, and lastly, and this is probably the biggest one for Germany to bear going forward, is that they're ordered to pay reparations, which I believe was 600 million 600 million um, pounds. Um, if they'd have continued to pay off in the instalments as originally planned in 1918, the last instalment would have been paid in 1985. Um, so that is, that, that, that's the terms that the Germans were basically forced to sign because their army had been beaten, the Navy is decimated. Um, they're not in, they're not in a position that they can, they can fight. Um, so that, that, that's, that, that, that was the outcome of their surrender. Yeah. And again, it's impact we'll talk about in a minute, because like you said, it's directly linked to World War II. Um, there, there, there was an, um, another thing as well um, that I just wanted to bring up, is all German colonies were given to Britain and France as well. So, yeah, so... A, 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 again, that goes back to sort of Britain's aims going into into the peace conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, um, that's that. And then you get the formation of the League of Nations on the 10th of January in 1920. Uh, 42 founding members. Um, its largest numbers of members will be 58. Um, to, to tell us a little bit about that, please, mate. Yeah, so this is... One of the few of the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson's um, ideas that he brings forward at the peace conference. So, League of Nations is a founding, is a precursor to the United Nations. Um, so that the idea is, is that nations can talk and they can get over problems and try to prevent wars because as we know the Great War at the time was known as the war to end all wars. Um, so hindsight tells us different. But so this was a way that they were hoping it could um, it could challenge that. Now it has some major flaws to it. Like like you say, you you, you could come and leave as you wished. It wasn't a it wasn't something that was particularly mandated that you had to be in. Um, and if one of the biggest problems is that it had the Americans, although it was their idea, or the Wilson's idea, they never actually joined. So post-1918, because Europe is shattered, this is when America really does take off to be the preeminent world power. They're not not being in it means that they go in a bit of a isolation isolationist period and so potentially that the, the country that's going to really hold hold this together isn't there so when you think of today's united nations security council it's normally it it was America and Russia batting heads. Now it's kind of America, China and Russia batting heads. Um, 
well, think of that without America in it. And that's what you got. It's a bit more looser. So it didn't work for that reason. Also, it didn't have it. It didn't, it, it, it couldn't bring an armed force to bear it on its behalf. So where the United Nations can put in neutral troops into conflict zones to keep, to try to keep the boring parties apart from each other and make sure that um, certain aspects of warfare is, is being, war, uh, rules of war being respected. Um, it didn't have that. So that's where it starts to fail. And then because you could come and go as you please, as the next part of the 20th century unfolds, you get certain countries leaving the League of Nations. So Japan leaves, Germany leaves, um, Italy leaves. So that your fascist countries, your communist countries, they'll start to leave. So it, 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 it what could have been a very good idea just didn't really get going, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And okay, so let's go back to Germany and their punishment because this really causes a problem in 1939. But then it goes back a little bit further than that because it it is so. Um, tell us about Germany and you know the, the the journey it goes through to get to that point. Yeah, so it, there's a lot of things that happen along the way. Um, so. Germany, it starts off, as we recall, at the time of the armistice, there's this um, attempted communist revolution. And to put it down, they call up German soldiers that are coming back to the front. Um, they're, they're not called up particularly by the government, but they join like, the, the sort of a right-wing element. So not to go as far as what would come, um, so probably more sort of like conservative slash republicanism sort of level of right wing um, status um, and that's what's known as the Freikorps and so they're fighting against the communists and eventually the Freikorps kind of win and you get the Vi- what's known as the Weimar Republic is from. Now, the Weimar, it, it gets that name because it sits in the small town of Weimar because Berlin at that point is too unstable for it to sit. So there, there's uh, numerous assassination attempts on the president, things like that. Um, but it kind of calms, it eventually starts to calm down until you get to 1923 when a hyperinflation crisis hits Germany and so very much similar to like what we're going through at the moment where prices start skyrocketing to compensate for that they start to print more money which then forces prices to go up even higher until basically the bottom of the market the currency falls out when that happens the Germans are unable to pay that instalment of their reparations and it brings in a French occupation of the Ruhr Valley. So they, they, they occupy the one of Germany's largest industrial areas and then basically take the profits that that can produce for themselves to pay for the reparations. Now, 1923 is also an important year because this is the year of the Munich Putsch. So this is an attempt by the Nazi party to take control of Bavaria. So it happens in the in the sort of the capital of Bavaria, Munich, and it happens in a beer hall. Um, that's where all the speeches occur. Um, so sometimes known as the beer hall putsch, and it's where sort of Hitler first comes to prominence. But he, so he comes to prominence um, in ninety in nineteen twenty three with the Munich putsch. It's a fiasco. They all get arrested, but he goes on trial and he uses the trial as an excellent piece of PR um, because he can just talk away and share his ideas. And a lot of these people that don't know who he is suddenly know who he is. Um, 
and then he gets sentenced to prison when actually he, because the judge in Munich was with right wing leanings, um, rather than being executed, which he probably would have been if he was a communist, for example. And whilst he's in jail, um, he writes Mein Kampf, which is his, um, the work that's known as his, My Struggle. And that's where he puts out all, all, all his ideologies. Things start to calm down because there's something called the Dawes Plan that comes into effect, which is long-term loans to Germany from America, and it will stay, it stabilises the economy. It gets it up and running under Stresemann, and it's all going along quite smoothly, quite well. Um, until you get to 1929, which is when the Wall Street crash happens, Suddenly, the loans from America are called in. And like the rest of the world after America, it's a turbulent time. And you get a lot of short, sharp elections in Germany because governments, they had a specific um, proportional representation system to try to prevent a one-party rule. And... Because you was uh, because they were unable to form these coalitions, it's very sort of similar to Northern Ireland at the moment, where you've constantly got one two sides and they're trying to form this power sharing government, and they sort of they'll form, but then it'll fall apart very quickly. So you get a lot of ups and downs, and through this period, twenty nine to thirty three, the Nazi Party goes get from being popular to being almost wiped out to coming back again. And eventually in 33, it's almost like, uh, well, we've got no, we, we've tried everyone else. Let's let, let, let this lot have a go. And th- so they get elected into power. But very quickly after that, you get things like the Reichstag fire and the Enabling Act and <clears throat> Hitler moving from chancellor to president and combining the two roles into one and all these different things that will eventually lead to a, to, to the dictatorship and going further on the lead up to World War Two. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for explaining. It is really fascinating period of history that I find fascinating. And um, if anyone's interested in that, there's a great documentary series uh, and it's free series now on BBC Two or BBC um, iPlayer called uh, The Rise of the Nazi. I would highly recommend it because it's very, very good. Um, yeah, that- I- uh, like the other thing I'd say is that, that if you was to take away the reverence that we hold the 11th of November in mm-hmm. and look at it at a similar level with say the armistice of Mudros and then start to point in other elements through the 20s and the 30s <coughs> so you're looking at like, the Russian Civil War Japanese expansion, the Sino-Japanese War, and the invasion of Manchuria, the Spanish Civil War, and the German sort of proxy war there with the Condor Legion. And then any of the flashpoints of the appeasement period when the reoccupation of the Rhineland, the Anschluss with Austria, the invasion the annexation of Sadat and then followed by the full invasion of Czechoslovakia, which was primarily to get for the Germans to get their hands on the Czech armaments industry through to the invasion of Poland. If you, if you plot that on a timeline, I would say that you could argue, definitely argue that the early 20th century was actually like, was a 30 year war. Mm-hmm. Yeah, agree. Um, but because our view of the end of the First World War, it takes away that because we're not directly involved. But it, there is a lot. It, it's more akin to the Napoleonic Wars or the Hundred Years' War, where it's a longer period of war. It's thirty years, but there's flashpoints all the way along, and there's that. It's bookended by two major ones, but in between. And in a lot of the cases, the causations for them and the Second World War all stem from the first. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's move back to um, 
Well, let's talk about remembrance now, because uh, here in the UK, we have a very important monument called the Cenotaph in yeah. Whitehall in London. It's a beautiful thing if you ever get a chance to see it in person. Very, very symbolic to us. It was unveiled in 1920. Uh, just talk a little bit about uh, Remembrance Sunday for us, please. Yeah, so Remembrance Sunday began, it actually became, began as a victory parade. Um, and the Cenotaph itself, the word means empty tomb. And the, that, the one that you've, you see in the picture is the second one. Okay, the first one was a plywood structure. It was only meant to be temporary for the Victory Parade to, um, to illustrate and to remember those who, who never came home. However, what occurred at the Victory Parade was that a lot of the grieving relatives traveled to London to view the Victory Parade. And in the weeks afterwards, I started laying flowers at it. And that was when it was then decided that we need that something permanent and formal needed to go, be put up. And because of the way that the country in 1920 reacted to the plywood structure, it decided that they would create exactly the same structure, but out of marble. Mm -hmm. And Remembrance Day from that point on took on a, di a, a different significance because it became more about the remembrance and less about the victory. Yeah. And, I mean, the Queen played a very important part in this ceremony and up until a few years ago, she would actually lay the wreath, would start the ceremony off, wouldn't she? She um, laid the wreath that she was... And then the last few few years she would still be on the balcony so it, it was it although king charles would lay it for her on her behalf um she would always she was always present and it was one of the non-negotiables in the calendar that that she attended that and one of the most important symbols of remembrance sunday of remembrance you know november is the poppy so yes. tell us about the story of the emergence of the poppy and why this has become a symbol of remembrance for the Commonwealth countries, in particular, also World War One, and, and really and truly every every uh, you know veteran event now, really. Yeah, so it it, it grew out of the obviously the, the the First World War and the Great War, and the poppy itself was seen as a form of remembrance because poppies like growing open or or disturbed countryside. So when the war was ongoing or and in the immediate aftermath when people were family members were starting to make the pilgrimage to see the graves of their their sons or their brothers or that they, they they were the only flowers that were growing. So or of the flowers that were growing the most recognizable. So then people were sort of like okay, it was that was picked, put on the grave. Um, but it, in that battle scarred landscape, the poppy was there, and so that's why it sort of it was it, it becomes that remembrance rebirth um, symbol, and also that you, when people were going around the cemeteries before they were laid out immaculately as they are today, the poppies were growing in the cemeteries as well, and then obviously it's become a more it's become more and more traditional now. Um, for example, we have the leaf that point that when you wear it properly points to eleven points to the eleven o'clock position on on the hands of the clock. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, so on the like the, the, the pin that you've got on there or what I've got up here. Yeah. Um, when you hold it, hopefully I can see it. When you hold it upright, it's obviously flipped on the screen. Um, but yeah, it, it it does actually point to eleven, the hands of eleven o'clock. Oh, I did really, I honestly, really didn't know that. And uh, Chris, you got some a great charity called um, British Royal Legion. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, the Royal British Legion. So British, Royal British Legion. Yeah, they started again the early twenties um, as a mixture of remembrance charity, but also um, to help wounded veterans. Mm -hmm. um, 
because obviously not all of the veterans who came came home came home in one piece. No. Um, they were all well. They all came in scars of of some description that we sort of know more about today. But obviously, um, they and actually one of the things that was issued to soldiers. Um, I don't think I've got it here, but I know my great granddad had one. Um, was actually what I called a wound, a wound badge. Um, so this was issued. My great granddad got discharged from medically discharged in the army after being gassed um, at Ypres in 1917. And so, because he was not carrying any obvious signs of wounding. Um, these badges were actually issued for like a lapel badge to show people when they were back home because obviously you had sort of um, problem, I wouldn't say problem, but the reaction to all sort of conscientious objectors um, was quite severe um, and things like that. So the idea was that they, they would wear, they could wear this badge on their everyday clothing so as to not get accused of cowardice or be attacked or anything like that. So it showed that they had been a soldier, but they'd been discharged um, due to due to injury because, as I say, especially sort of people that were um, wounded with, from gas attacks showed no outward signs of injury, um, but, their, but their lungs were shot. Wow. Okay. Well, all that's left to say is thanks, Mark. And also, I'm just going to put this one out there because uh, the 11th of November is really important. So whatever you're doing at 11 o'clock on the 11th of November, make sure you take a couple of minutes to remember not just the, 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 the men that fell in World War I, but all veterans that have fought in all wars. And it's important that we remember that. Thanks, Mark. Cheers. Right. Well done.